Hello and welcome to the Winter Enrichment Programs panel, virtual panel, wild card when scientists and artists collaborate. I'm really excited to have you here. And welcome to the Winter Enrichment Programs panel, virtual panel, wild card when scientists and artists collaborate. I'm excited to have you here. My name is Irene Hediger, and I'm the head of the Artisan Labs program. And together with Marilo Bulo, we have been facilitating the Kaust Swiss Residency Exchange, connecting artists and scientists at Kaust and the Kingdom and beyond. We will be moderating the I will be moderating the panel conversations and we would of course invite you to participate in the conversations. So please do not hesitate to place your questions into the chat and we will do our best to answer our all possible questions in the time we have. Joining us today so are the two passionate and amazing artists Mohana Chono from the Kingdom and Julien Charrière from Switzerland and of course also the very passionate scientists Francesca Benzoni and, and also Christopher Robinson, um, a stream ecologist from EAWAG in Switzerland. And you might know Francesca Benzoni from KAUS. She is a scientist at the Red Sea Research Center. With us in the room is also Joe Watkins. He's live, he's a live sketching artist from Sketch Effects. And he's joining us today from Ohio in the US. And we, he will be emulating this conversation into a visual map and we will see, we will have a look at this right at the end of this panel. And so now, well, now without further ado, we would like to start with the presentations of the panelists. So Francesca, the floor is yours to present yourself. Thank you, Irene. Um, good afternoon to all the panel, panelists, to all the attendees, and I'm delighted to be part of this uh, Web 2021 uh, panel discussion. Um, I am Francesca Benzoni, I am a marine biologist, and exactly a year ago I joined KAUST um, and um, the Red Sea Research Center, uh, where I'm a professor, associate professor in marine science. So in the last uh, 20 years, my scientific research has revolved around a group of marine invertebrates um, uh, that contribute uh, to the functioning structure of some important ecosystems in the marine environment. Um, corals, uh, structuring and functioning of uh, coral reefs. Um, my research here at CAOS, my lab addresses different aspects of research uh, of the evolution, diversity, and biogeography of these organisms and of the ecosystems that they form. So our project spans from uh, habitat mapping to coevolution of marine invertebrates. Um, we basically investigate, discover, and describe. And our ultimate objective is to inform about the diversity, distribution, spatial, and temporal patterns of the Red Sea marine resources. These resources, like coral reefs, um, are a wealth, uh, are a fortune for the countries that, that own them, in this case, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But they also represent a great challenge for their conservation and management, uh, especially in the light of the, the country ambitious plans for development. So you might wonder, why am I here? Um, well, from the research methods we use in the field or in the lab to the way we present and communicate the results of our research. There is a great component of detecting and presenting uh, morphological patterns. So it's a very visual thing that we do. So we gather information from 
and we present information through uh, various aspects of the morphology of the organisms and the ecosystems we study. So it's a highly visual endeavor uh, that is directly connected with the aesthetic value of the organisms and the, uh, and the uh, ecosystems we study, of course. Um, visual communication is not only key to presenting scientific research, but it's also really, really strategic in a much broader sense because it appeals to um, and attracts attention from the general public, the stakeholders, and ultimately it can be harnessed to uh, highlight conservation issues. Uh, plus on a personal note, I really, really like the art forms in nature uh, ever since I was a kid. Um, so it's perhaps not surprising at all that when I reached KAUST, uh, and the uh, Red Sea Research Center director, Professor Michael Berman, put me in connection with, uh, with uh, the um, artist in lab program. And I immediately thought this would be something that I wanted to explore because to kind of um, get involved in this in, in connect, in intimate connection between um, the artist and the scientist seemed like a great idea, not just uh, for my personal interest, but also for the intellectual growth of my students. Um, and so I'm happy to say that in the next semester, we'll be hosting um, an artist that's here with us today, Julien. Uh, Charrière. And uh, with that, I think I'll leave the floor to the next uh, person you want to introduce, Irene. Yes, thank you, Francesca, for this brief introduction. And then I hand over uh, to the artist Julien Charrière, who will be joining you very soon, actually, at KAUST. Uh, yes, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here speaking with you today. And uh, obviously very excited about being next week in Saudi Arabia uh, at KAUST in the Habitat and Venting Biodiversity Lab with you, Francesca. Um, I'm a French and Swiss artist uh, based in Berlin. I'm actually working with a very wide range of media coming from performance, sculpture, photography, videography, as well as immersive uh, installation. And I would say that in my work, I tend to explore some idea and concept related to nature and the transformation of a time, regardless of deep geological time, human related time, over time, we kind of like have an influence of our concept and construction. And I would say that one of the key kind of core of my practice is really to see where this humankind sphere interact or where the friction happen with other agency beings or realities. And I'm very uh, looking forward to explore this topic uh, underwater in Saudi Arabia. And I just gonna share my screen and maybe show you just a few uh, projects that I have been working on lately. So if it's working. Um, yeah, so here it's a um, picture which are the result of a performance I did uh, in the Arctic where I decided to climb an iceberg and then to try to melt it down for seven hours with a gas torch, a little blow torch, uh, in order to kind of reverse the idea that we inherit from uh, the romantic ex um, aesthetic where the observer is always separated from the object of observation. So here I really put myself, but it's not so important that I'm that, I put the silhouette, which is kind of like a projection surface for a viewer within the picture, and I'm actually melting down the eyes under my feet. Uh, I think that's speak a little bit for itself. Um, here's another project, very different. So my project always bring me to to a lot of different places. And very early on, I decided that uh, field work would be kind of the one of the core of my practice and that the studio will not be just uh, in Berlin, but actually everywhere around the world. Uh, here, what we're looking at are pictures of the Bikini Atoll, where I spent a month in 2017, trying to document the landscape, uh, as well as trying to kind of make visible something that human senses normally uh, don't see, in this case, radioactivity. So what you see here is a double exposure, a picture, one exposition, and then I take this picture uh, out of the camera and spread some radioactive sand onto the negative and let this one 
imprint uh, the negative before developing. So the geist or ghosts that you kind of see on this picture are actually the result of the radiation burning into the negative. And what you see in the background is uh, the island of Bikini. And perhaps I show a last project. Um, this is a, a collaboration that I did with another artist, but we also had the help of, of scientists to achieve it. So we decided to develop a camera system which could be attached to the antler of a deer in the exclusion zone of Chernobyl. And this camera will film the landscape within the retina of the animals and uh, will at some point uh, release itself from the antler and we will just collect this camera which had a little GPS emitter and then take the footage of, um, of the eye of the deer and a reflection of a particular landscape. And then we cut a, a video together with uh, some found footage from early space conquest. Because for us, it was interesting that, that we have like this relation of like mankind willing to emancipate from his own planet. And then the exclusion zone, which somehow is like an emancipation and voluntary, but within uh, the ecosystem. So I think that I'm done with my presentation and maybe I'll pass the word to someone else. Thank you very much, Julien, uh, for this introduction. Now we hand over to Christopher from Switzerland. Hello, everybody. I am Christopher Robinson from the AAVOG, which is a federal institute on aquatic ecology based in Switzerland. And my specialty is alpine aquatic systems, alpine streams, and I work on everything from uh, insects to bacteria up to all the way up to ecosystems and the physical chemistry of these systems over time. So a lot of my work has to do with climate change at the moment, as I hope everyone knows that our glaciers are receding very quickly and that actually enhances my research uh, curriculum. So this is just one of those slides I have from one of my research centers in the Swiss National Park, where I'm very fortunate to be working for the last 20 years. I've been in the, the program Artisan Labs program now for, uh, oh, since 2005, I think I started. A little too much. And uh, so I have about seven artisan labs and in, in residents in my, in my lab and in my group. And, and it's been very fruitful in terms of my research, in terms of their bringing their perspectives, especially on the physical environment of water and how they perceive water in the, in the environment and how they perceive ice in the environment. But we also get them in the labs like this uh, particular slide is showing. Uh, so they do actually do some out some research in the lab and and use that research for their particular products that they're having during their residence. And the other one here is just one that uh, Zara from from the coast uh, uh, from Saudi Arabia, artists in Saudi Arabia, developed up in the alpine uh, landscape, and that actually withstood the length of time for about two or three years before it's finally washed out of the system. But it was a very interesting one that attracts quite a few tourists up in the area as well. So it was a very dynamic interaction that she had in this alpine landscape. But uh, one aspect I do bring to my knowledge is, is this whole perspective on how we see water and, and the various shapes of water, whether it's ice, whether it's liquid, even in the gaseous phases. So the artists that I've had in my lab have, have documented all sorts of strange behaviors with the aquatic insects I take for granted in my in my lectures and I take for granted when I see them in the field but when the artist comes in it opens my eyes to be uh, to be renewed in some respects in terms of what I see in the field and how I actually portray that to my students so it's a very interesting interaction and I, I, I find it very helpful for me to communicate my science better to the public and to my students one of the highlights we had in the last couple of years was this artist and science uh, collaboration we had at the ETH in Zurich, which is the university that I that I teach at. And uh, actually, Irene and I developed a publication, or uh, edited a publication, in a publication series, I should say, uh, where we actually had artists and labs that were collaborating in research, and they published their results in a scientific journal. Uh, that came out last year, I believe, and uh, so we were able to get a couple papers actually documenting this, this fact of the collaboration between art and science. So it is, it is wide ranging, it is global. Uh, the ETH in Zurich is just one of those universities where it's very active, but uh, if you go on the web anywhere, you'll see that many universities have this very active participation in science and art and the collaboration between the two. So 
I'm just happy to be part of it, and uh, I'll end there with my presentation. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Christopher. And now the floor is to Muhanat Shono. He is joining us from Riyadh in the kingdom. Thank you, Muhanat. Thank you, Irene. Hello, everybody. My name is Muhanat Shono. I'm an artist. I was born in Riyadh. So I started off as an illustrator. I used to tell stories and produce self-published comic books when I was younger. Um, when I was a child in school, teachers used to tell us to strike a line through the neck of these characters or creations that I was creating in my mind. In my mind, this was an assault on my imagined world. Um, and I decided from a very young age to use the line, not as a tool to capitate, but as a tool to tell stories and to create. So since then, I've been exploring the role of the line and the ink uh, and the paper in my work. For example, here, uh, trying to rediscover new meaning, uh, new words of expression emerging from once abandoned but fertile landscapes. I've also explored uh, work in a sculptural sense, uh, exploring themes such as freedom of speech and uh, freedom of expression in journalism. Uh, also, when I was younger, the, the role of the visceral ink was used uh, to censor a lot of text, books, ideas, and images. And the role of this visceral void of black became very interesting because it hyper accelerated my imagination. Because when I opened up a book and it was censored in black, uh, I had to imagine what was missing. So this idea of lost narrative below the black ink was very interesting. I've also explored uh, and worked more recently on producing sculptural sketches of lines exploring space uh, history and events. And uh, more recently, last year, this installation of Desert X in Al Ala, which was a, a, an experiential installation where the audience could not photograph the work from one angle, but yet had to experience the journey of the lost path. And more, more kind of related to what we're talking about here is the collaboration with science um, producing interactive robotic work that, um, for example, explores themes of our connection to a higher power. Um, and this collaboration with a neurorobotics lab in Berlin, where we explored uh, the idea of ritual machines that could produce rituals on our behalf and create connectivity and ceremony uh, automatically as more people interact with each of these devices. And the most, you know, my most favorite experience was the Artists and Labs program where I was embedded with the microbiology lab in, uh, in Airwag. And what I explored with the researchers there was the idea of idea organisms that embodied their research, their work, their passions. And we created, a, at the end of the experience, an installation where we literally connected uh, the stories, the experiences, and the research of the different uh, uh, researchers uh, at, at the center together to tell one unified story, one uh, connected uh, uh, microbiome of ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohanet. Thank you to all the panelists for this brief um, um, introduction to a very, very broad and wide field, of course, of uh, how you ask questions and how you are working with your environment. And I would like to know um, why, what is your motivation and why is it in actually interesting to work across borders and, and, this, and in this specific field between art and science or between the artists and scientists. And I would like to address this question first to Julia. Uh, yes. Well, I think that the first thing before maybe trying to give an answer is very complicated is to see 
why artists and scientists somehow are very similar uh, in the way they approach the world. I mean, I would say that scientists and artists are a type of um, reality producer. They both try to understand and explain the world in their own way. And they're both using a very abstract language to do so. So while maybe we both train in inquiry and questioning, seeing that obviously the scientists always tend to, to want to put themselves out of the picture. And so they have like a more objective kind of result while the artists while questioning are maybe putting themselves in the center, which gives something which is more subjective. But at the end of the day, that's all kind of like, depending on the frame of reference, you are looking at the thing. But, but this similarity make a collaboration or make a, you know, like a, a dialogue much easier between both of them. And then, I mean, to get maybe more to the, the actual topic or question, I think it's difficult because there's kind of like an unbalance. I mean, we all know that a lot of artists are going to a scientific institution, but we don't know many scientists spending three months in an artist studio, which I think could be also very, uh, you know, very interesting experience. And basically an artist in a scientific institution have a lot to learn about. Now there's like so much material, so much uh, new topic, so much inspiration. It's, it's, I mean, we are like, I think that both scientists and artists are very curious type of person. And so as an artist in a scientific uh, institution, there's just too much to see uh, to get bored. So I think that this, the question is more important on the other side, what can perhaps a scientist learn from an artist or from an artist coming in a lab and why is uh, this tendency rising lately because we hear more and more here artists in labs there and here you know like this more and more artists and more and more funding to bring artists within those institutions i think that's maybe something which happened in the last 10 years uh i'm actually coming to Carl's to answer the question because myself i never have been in such a situation but i mean i guess that today uh we kind of understood that specification had its limitation and, and that the fact that uh, uh, science is a lot of time kind of like a targeted research where we really want to reach something and maybe because it's so specific, the scientist kind of like lost the capacity to extrude itself and maybe to have like the, the brighter look. So I think that an artist, which is a real sharp observer can always come within this kind of scheme and, and help a scientist to actually unlearn about his own praxis. And, um, and I think that obviously the artists have another cultural baggage and, and we are actually more free to bridge different disciplines. And in, in this way, we can also just perhaps open doors or open like way to new source. So that's, but again, like, um, I would say that obviously the methodology is very similar, but I never have been in, into uh, such a situation. So it's, it's a very theoretical what I'm, what I'm speaking about now. Okay, thank you. So Francesca, I hand over to you from your perspective, of course, as a scientist. So what do you think, or what is your hope you could unlearn or maybe go into um, undefined territories with an artist. I would say that I still have so much to learn that if I start unlearning, it's not a good thing. But I understand what you know Julian's perspective is that, and I think what uh, you know would be great to be able to have time to spend in an internship in an artistic lab, in an artist lab. Sorry. Um, yet not quite feasible for the way our work is structured, but it's exactly the reason why this program, so to have the connection, the connectivity realized between the artists coming into a lab, kind of fills that um, void and makes this interaction possible for the scientists. Um, I'm really excited to have this, you know, having this long-term internship uh, because it will involve all the aspects of our work where Julian is going to be with us and the life we have here at Chaos, which is you know, a very specific place where the community life and, and the work life are really interconnected. So I think it's gonna be a very holistic experience for you, Julien. 
Um, but I'm also really, really interested to see how this new perspective is going to, to play out because we have our research methods and we know what we're going to look for. Having somebody from the outside joining us in the field, in the lab, and kind of helping us explore that kind of methodology, I think could be really, really interesting. Or even just the questions um, about the methodology and the, the scientific questions can prompt in our minds um, doubts or new ideas. And so I think I really have, I'm sorry to put this pressure on you, Julian, but I really have high expectations from this. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna, we're also gonna be positively surprised. And as I said before, it's, it's for me, but also for the students, because I think that on, uh, you know, young researchers, young scientists that are in their phase of formation, to have that insight, to have that interaction with somebody that's a researcher of a different field uh, is really, really uh, important to broaden our perspectives. So I do think that we are going to mutually benefit from this, and I'm really keen to, to have this happen. It has happened to me once to interact with artists during field work before, years ago, a decade already. I was involved in a, in a scientific expedition at sea, so we would spend a month at sea at a time. And with it, you know, among the crew and scientists, there would be uh, an artist, and that was already great. Um, but this is going to be a different uh, kind of interaction because it's going to involve real life work. Because when you are on an expedition and you're on a boat, it's kind of a parallel universe. It's really, really nice, but it doesn't represent all the steps of the actual life of, of the researcher. So we'll see. Great. Thank you, Francesca. And I'm now picking up on a question that is already in the chat. So everybody is uh, already participating. Thank you for that. And um, I'm asking Muhanat about communication. You've had the experience of uh, working with scientists at EAVAC and how, what is the kind of language and are there problems with understanding each other and how do you overcome them actually? Yes, the, the Artisan Labs program was actually the first time I, you know, was sent into a science-based space. Um, and I wasn't nervous, I was very hopeful um, and I was pleasantly surprised because People like uh, Chris and Frederick who are running the programs were very welcoming and they were actually very excited to have us there. And it was, you could sense the value uh, that was, was felt about having us part of the program. And I was, um, you know, I, find, I found that I was, you know, my confidence was reinforced in a way because you're able to speak to people um, on, the, on the same level. You're coming from this same place of common curiosity about things and trying to find answers for, for, for uh, interesting topics and important topics. Uh, so so I, there, you know, there wasn't sort of a, a level of discourse that needed to happen. It was actually very natural. It was very intuitive and it was very human. Uh, and I think that's what's interesting about um, the Artisan Labs program and those types of collaborations I've had since is people making space for other people and their ideas. And that was very interesting. And maybe Chris, your point of view, you've had this experience now for a few times. So how was it to work with very different artists as well? Um, and how did you find a, a common way of understanding each other? Yeah. I like I said, I've been in the, in the program now since around 2005, I think, when I had my first artist. And that one actually had a background in environmental chemistry. So it was very interesting that she had a, a separate degree already in environmental sciences. So it was quite uh, interesting to see how she used that to, to create art. And that way we looked at pollution in waters and how we could actually visualize pollution in waters. And that was very interesting from my perspective of actually how to communicate our research because scientists tend to use numbers and graphs and plots and these kind of graphic illustrations. Whereas when you have an artist come into your lab, you actually have a new form of communication of how to actually take your results and actually show it to the public where they actually have a, a different perspective or a different idea of what you're trying to relate to the public and actually to the other people that are looking at your research. So it was very interesting from that point of view. But I've had, I've had artists from China, I've had artists from India, and they've all brought in new perspectives. I recall the one from India that had never even seen ice before. 
and ice in my in my field i'm an alpine ecologist so ice i see every day basically so it's like well it's just ice but she looked at the ice and saw the air bubbles in the ice and saw the ice melting and saw how how it actually how it develops in the landscape as well so her perspective what it was in the landscape was quite different than what how i perceive ice in the landscape so something like Julian doing his uh, his iceberg research you know his iceberg melting uh, it's it's really an interesting way of looking at our science from the eyes of an artist, but also how they communicate what they see, and that transcends to our our research as well. But I also find it very interesting because we have we both have the same creative intuition, um, artists and, and scientists. And I remember being at Kaust, uh, you know, last year and, and talking about this as well, and saying that well, every every scientist has a little artist inside them. You know, it's like one of our little programs we have in our brains is to try to present ourselves as an art, artist in some respects, uh, and primarily because of this way of communicating art and science. And um, and I think it's just uh, astounding how how similar they are in terms of trying to get a product. You know, ours might be written papers, and they may have uh, illustrations, installations, uh, graphics uh, that they that artists produce. But uh, I think the two, when, they, when we do collaborate, is just really an intensive creative process that actually uh, magnifies both parties, I think, in some respects. I don't think it's just, you know, it's a, it's a synergy and not a, not additive, but an actual uh, multiplication of, of the, of the process itself, of this creative process that we both experience. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Actually, um, I, I see a question here um, that is stating, is it true that artists and scientists share similar cognitive processes? We don't have a um, scientist, I think, here on the panel to really answer it scientifically. Um, but I don't know if somebody wants to, to, to say something about that. I can jump in just to give you that obviously I am not qualified to answer this question. Let's disclaim the situation like this. Uh, but um, I can tell you about my experience when interviewing the different artists that were going to be selected for, for, this, um, for this experience. It was the first time that I actually listened or, to or interviewed um, artists that have this interest in, in, in science. And it appeared clear to me that, yes, they do research. They do research exactly as we do it. Uh, they have to study. They have to uh, be aware of the references, the context. Um, and then they have to apply methods, obtain results and present them. So where's the difference? So I don't know about the cognitive pathways or processes, because again, that's not my field of expertise, but from the procedural point of view, from the kind of effort and time and process, I see a, a lot of similarities actually. And, and I think that was what really caught me about this potential internship and, and connection with an artist, because it, you know, it went beyond being something interesting and maybe beautiful to see, uh, to something that really would be, um, in, in terms of pathways of research, uh, integrative for us, if that makes any sense. I think it does. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, um, and, how, I mean, with like working together, I guess we all have an image of, you know, how scientists uh, are, what it looks like in the lab and so on. Um, or, or we have pre-assumptions, of course, about something we do, do not have access to and something we do not know. So maybe also to Muhana, the question, how did it change your... Um, outlook or, or, you know, how did it change to, to be there immersed, how it is to work with scientists or what they are actually working on? Did it change something in the perception, staying in perception? Yes, it, it definitely did. It, it changed the way I kind of approach problem solving. Uh, but also I realized that this human connection, you know, is very important. And a lot of the researchers and the scientists wanted to connect on a, on a, on a, on an emotional level. They thought that because somehow, because I'm an artist that I should kind of evaluate what they're doing. And was this, was, was, was the work they're doing for many, many, many years 
useful for kind of humanity. They they sort of thought, uh, some thought that an artist's work is more impactful because they are often stuck for many, many years researching the same kind of very important yet small topic uh, very specifically and, and not able to interact with the public uh, so kind of openly and freely about what they're doing. It takes a long time and a lot of patience. Um, so the connection wasn't always um, in the direction of science. It was also in the direction of the, of the humanities. And they wanted to speak about, was it you know, important? As, was it, some, some would say, crazy enough, uh, was it as important as doing art? And they were questioning after many, many years of research. And, and that's a crazy statement to say, because of course it's more important than art. Uh, the, the research was saving lives, the research related to health, so I found it interesting where we kind of, you know, the meeting was somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and that's where I kind of uh, found it to be the most valuable. I think from my side, it's a, a different kind of game in terms of the creative process of bringing the, the artists into my lab was actually bringing them into the interaction of my students as well. So. My last artist, Zara from uh, from Saudi Arabia, was very interactive with, with the group, my team in the field, and they just learned so much and brought new perspectives from having Zara in the field. Uh, so for me, it's not just the the scientists and the artists collaborating together, but also what the artists brought to the future of a uh, of scientists, you know, the future scientists of the world, and that was a to me a very big part of it. You know, we talk about training students went very early on and, and part of that is bringing these different perspectives into these students allow them to actually mature during their tenure whether it's a graduate student or a master's student or even undergraduates you know how they develop and how artists can contribute to their lives as well okay and Shilia, can you say something maybe about your processes and what is, you know, um, in, the, in the way you are developing your art, uh, how important is process and what is maybe the relationship to, from process to outcome? Um, well, I would say that um... For me, it's very loose, but somehow experimental, the way I'm engaging with the world. But very, uh, very early on, I had this intuition that I also need to sense the world in order to kind of like understand it and perhaps describe it on an artistic level. And, and therefore, I was saying it in my presentation very early, I, I start to do some field trip, which obviously are probably similar in the methodology that what the scientists will do, but I'm not going on a volcano or an iceberg to collect some data, but to collect impression, emotion, momentum that I then try to transcend or transcribe into an artwork. So I'm trying to distill reality. And this reality is a tangible reality. So it's something that you can observe. So this, this idea of being an observer but also being part of the object of observation and having this kind of feedback loop. I think that's, uh, that's something we learned from quantum physics that uh, an observer is never neutral. You actually, to observe is to influence. You're changing the system. Once you want to know how much pressure you have in your tire, you need to open the tire. When opening the tire, you have a little bit of pressure less. So it's actually not neutral what you're doing. Seeing as an artist is similar. And, um, and for, for me, yeah, in, I kind of developed this methodology while also looking or coming close to scientists without really never uh, maybe making like one step further and directly collaborating with scientists. I have been in contact and also collect a lot of knowledge from them because sometimes I wanted to translate things that they didn't thought about. So I've been working with the Geo Institute in Potsdam because I was very interested in you know, earthquake, but like man-made earthquakes or how Berlin resonate, what is the vibration of, of a city and how this vibration is coming into the soil and how this could become like a work of art. And so we, we develop a technology to actually um, sense the vibration of the city and then translate it to the glass of a building. So the building will become 
this kind of like um, instrument sensing the activity of the everyday life. So again, I, I, I have been in contact, but I never been like really like spending uh, months together. But I, I think that um, that is always something which is floating there. So without science, I, I will not do the work I am doing. And it's kind of like one of the core of my inspiration. And um, yeah, I don't know if that's an answer to your question. But it's kind of like how I engage with process. So I, I actually, you know, I mean, like, like a scientist, we have maybe, a, you know, an intuition, a purpose, and then perhaps we start to research and then we have an hypothesis. And then we try to experiment in order to see what this hypothesis is about. And then maybe then we split perhaps the scientists collect data and try to make sense out of this data. And then the artist, because we have like this uh, possibility to be more loose, probably we, we can then have the experiment and this experiment give as well a conclusion, which, which is at the end of the day, very subjective on a way, not so empiric, but I mean, I think that's what Francesca said, the process to get to the result is actually almost the same. I mean, at least, yeah, that's what I think. Now, I think from also my experience, there are very many similarities in the process and the processes are long. And maybe we tend to forget that in the arts because the arts, they, they reach out to an audience, you see the end result. But at the same time, I am under the impression also in science, we have like results um, that are then, well, at least in, in, the, in the public realm, it is communicated as like some kind of results. So how, how do you think, um, how, what do you think, or who would you like to reach actually? Um, and I'm asking uh, this to Francesca, like when you do your science, you know, who is your audience basically? And who could it also potentially be? I see myself as, you know, somebody that has to produce knowledge that's the you know and knowledge is just for everyone who wants to use it it's the most democratic thing you can do actually i think to produce informations that are fact based so the the key here is that we don't interpret in a way we we do when we present uh, the problem or the discussion under a certain light but what we should be doing is exactly what julian was saying before distilling what happens in the nature world into a scientific publication, which is, you know, the main way we we do present our results uh, to the public. Um, so I would say, of course, you know, colleagues in your uh, general area of expertise, and then the wider scientific community. But really, anybody, especially nowadays, uh, you you can access much of the scientific content um, freely online. Uh, whereas, you know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, when I was doing my PhD, I still had to go into libraries to do photocopies of papers that had been published, and I would spend weeks. And and Chris is laughing because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you had to access information that was really hard to, to find. Nowadays, this is just happening at the speed of light. Um, and that's great. And it means that not only you can gather much more information, but you also can disseminate it um, much faster into a much broader audience. Um, and so uh, who, am I, who am I researching for? I would say for everybody. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, underlines my lab's research is really to go underwater, observe, collect data, collect information. So we, we do less of manipulative experiments. We're more onto the descriptive side of things. And the, the really the, the objective is to kind of bring out from the sea um, all general kind of information and, and description about the evolution of organisms, their interactions, their distribution, their variability in time and space, why they are there. Um, and in order to do that, you know, we use different methodologies, but the end result needs to be public. So I, when, I, when I do write a research paper, I do it, of course, 
following the rules of scientific publications that need to comply with certain you know, requirements from uh, the editor or the peer review process, but the ultimate goal is to have it out there. And I also think, I, can I jump in Irene quickly? I, I also think that you know, we tend to exist in bubbles. So you know, the art scene is seem, seems inaccessible and a bit you know, conceptual and, and, and all, seems to attract a certain kind of audience. And then science can also seem intimidating and inaccessible and you, uh, maybe the language is not really uh, something people can grasp. And I think part of this collaboration is to kind of allow us and science to break out of our bubbles and sort of reach out to a wider space uh, of, of discourse. If, my, if I may add something, I think one of, I don't have expectations, but I have hopes. One thing that I hope that this interaction can bring forward um, is perhaps an alternative narrative to presenting the issues of conservation of the marine environment uh, in the region where we are, for example. So there is a, a growing attention. Um, the general public stakeholders, you know, ministries know about the importance of certain um, marine resources, their value and the threats they're currently undergoing. But perhaps having an artistic narrative on as an additional layer of information to try to convey that message, a kind of capture the attention, awaken the, uh, the, the attention, I think could be a distinctive advantage. And so I, I, I by no, no mean mean pressure on Julien's, but that, that would be one of my hopes to have a, a one more tool, one more way to communicate about the, uh, the need for conserving certain resources, for example. Julien, the question to you um, about when, when you are doing your art uh, and exploring uh, what you're exploring, are you thinking of an audience at all or who you're addressing or what is the process there as an artist? Well, I think uh, as an artist, I mean, there's different type of processes, but for me, I'm always trying to uh, think a work for everyone. So um, I think that, um, yeah, Mohana said it uh, right. Sometimes the art world seems to be a bubble, which is very complex. Uh, to penetrate and understand. Um, and I think there's a lot of self uh, referencing also in the art world and the way like uh, contemporary art is developed today. And so that's something that I'm actually working against. So every time I engage with something, obviously I'm, I'm first trying to understand what this place or these particular things make to me and how I react and enter in like a fruitful dialogue with, with a certain uh, uh, framework. But then I'm also kind of trying to think further and see, okay, in my like in my outcome, what is you know like different? I mean, we're living in a in a world of a lot of different color and culture, and how the subject address can resonate in a very broad audience, which at the end of the day is also very international. And, and knowledge should be free and accessible, and I think through internet it is, and therefore. When I think about my work, I'm not thinking about um, the public in the German or Swiss museum. I'm trying to kind of see, okay, I'm filming in Greenland for three years, what will be, and I'm not trying to bring my movie back to Greenland, and maybe it will work out, but even if it's not, when I was shooting it, I was kind of thinking about the fisherman, I was on the boat to actually shot, and how this person will react or engage with the piece I'm producing. So it's really, I'm trying to, to make a web of, of you know, like um, layers of meaning, which can actually, um, yeah, resonate in, in, in different, um, in, in a broader audience. So that's kind of like the way I, I probably approach my work. So every, everybody or like everyone who should be in contact with a certain piece should at least get something out of it. Even if you don't understand it, I mean, you always have an emotional, um, you know, like, you getting in a show and you're coming out. And, and one thing that I'm really afraid of is when someone come out and is frustrated or intimidated and say, well, this artist just think I'm stupid. And this person could have a PhD in quantum physics. And that's really uh, something which happen, happen a lot of time because some uh, artistic language are very complex and, and almost uh, impenetrable. And that's, um, 
I'm trying to democratize a lot when I'm when I'm actually seeing about the outcome and what I'm putting in the world. So. I might add too, this, you know, we're, we're talking about the process of art and science and, and in some regards, we look at the process in terms of making products, but in both cases, you know, we also see the similarity that it's a long-term process. You know, we, we do science to develop knowledge and improve our understanding of systems. And also, I also see that in the long-term progress of, of artists as well. You know, they have their, their process where they're making their individual statements, but they're also uh, developing their art over, over their career as well. So uh, for, for a scientist, you know, when we start out early, early in life, we actually are developing our career, but I, I'm now at near the end of this uh, career stage of my life. And uh, in the last 10 years, I am actually developing more communication rules in terms of facilitating science and transferring that science to the public and, and, actually adapting to where I write and how I write my articles. You know, it's not so important that I have to get my papers out in the best journals now. I actually will publish uh, papers in high impact, uh, non-peer reviewed papers so that the practice, you know, the praxis oriented people can actually read them and understand them. And that might be one way that we could actually really collaborate with artists because that's where you actually put some more uh, il illustrative images into these, these kind of articles that would actually help us communicate what we're trying to say to uh, to our managers and our resource managers. Thank yeah, you. I a, I, I, I'm sorry. I had a question for you, Chris, which, because um, you, you seem to have the, the longest experience with this type of collaboration, but you're always talking about your lab and your students, but I want just to hear in a broader context, how this collaboration actually taken in consideration by your peers, because you seems to have like anyway, this, this kind of connection, but that's, I think, not the case of everyone around you. And I was just curious to hear if it's actually inseminating also like the colleagues and, and a broader kind of scope of people within the institution, or if it's kind of staying really much with you because you have this particular sensitivity. Well, you're right. I've been in, in the game for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> in some respects, in respects, but also fortunately, but uh, but no, I think especially in the last five, maybe even ten years, we have seen a tremendous development in the art science collaborations. Uh, even the you know some of the society meetings that I go to, we actually have sessions where art and science come together, and we actually have uh, full packages, almost day you know full days on on the collaboration between art and scientists. Uh, so this was not the case, you know, five, 10 years ago. So I think in some respects, the this whole idea of collaboration between art and science is growing and, and we're just, we're just hitting the wave on it. You know, I, you know, we're starting to surf and it's, it's coming up to the tip of the wave. Uh, so it's a great time to be, uh, you know, into the art science game and, and you guys are just prime on it. You know, the work that Muhana does is just incredible and what you're doing, this stuff is just going to be tremendous in terms of collaborating with art and science and and bringing bringing those two processes together and and just the synergy that happens when you do this so so for me it's uh you know 10 years ago when i got into it actually well 15 years now it wasn't quite the same you know people looked at me like an oddball but now everybody's doing it frankly i i don't it's amazing how many people are involved in some sort of collaboration with an artist or some sort of collaboration with a scientist uh yeah so it's getting really good it's really a positive side of, of the field in both directions. Okay, just to, um, we have one last question. Um, and, and then I think we slowly have to wrap up. Unfortunately, time flies. Um, for me, it's also the question of like, you know, the importance of misunderstanding and also like the glitch in the relationships and also like kind of failures. If it's now between your peers, but also, uh, being confronted with other points of view. Um, how does this inform what you're doing? Like the artists and the scientists, of course, you know, like misunderstandings, how important are they in what you're doing? Anybody? Well, again, from my perspective, I don't see that as being a major issue because when you bring an artist into your group, it actually facilitates the communication and, and the process. It actually uh, enables to 
actually reduce these misunderstandings. So it's actually on the other side of, of the coin. And I think, and I think it's kind of interesting when there are, and I think what Chris is saying is like, it kind of disrupts, uh, you know, kind of entrenched methods of communication that are just kind of become uh, kind of maybe lethargic or people are not talking to each other because they're used to each other and they'll be doing things for many, many years. Suddenly you, you inject an artist into the space and people need to speak and need to communicate and to explain to the artist and, and thus they're explaining to each other again. And the mistakes or the miscommunication actually is the most beautiful part of this of this collaboration because it's 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 these uh, they indicate uh, unexpected ways of thinking that weren't happening before. Um, it, it's it's questioning. It, it triggers kind of different responses, and it leads to unexpected outcomes, which is the best part. Yeah, it's you know, as a newcomer to this interaction, I'm not concerned at all about misunderstandings. I know there will be. Um, and I think that this disruptive value of a misunderstanding in this case between you know, the artists and, and the scientists can actually help us find alternative ways to communicate because of, of course, if there's been a misunderstanding is either or, or both parts that kind of made a mistake either in expressing themselves or understanding or assuming that things would work another way. And so it's just, I think it's probably, you know, the beauty of it. If an artist came in my lab and knew exactly what to do and we had to explain him nothing and we were talking to speaking the same language and there would be no misunderstanding, it would be pretty boring, I think. Right. Also, I think that there's maybe like two different uh, case study, right? Because once is maybe what I'm, we'll be doing at Chaos, which is more uh, interdisciplinary. So I'm coming and then we will have dialogue and I will follow you and and perhaps there will be artworks or, 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 or new research starting from this point. But this, uh, and then there's like another thing that we call uh, transdisciplinary. And I don't know if Chris, you have an example, but this would be more like a project where people really get together in, in order to transcend the discipline and get to a common output. And I'm not saying that we won't do that, Francesca. <laughs> Let's hope. But um, yeah, no, no, for sure. And no pressure on you. <laughs> but um, Obviously, that's like two other two different leverage, I think, in, in terms of like how an artist and scientist interact within like one given environment. And I don't know if if if, if one of you, because Irene also know like a lot of this collaboration, have you experienced a, a project which probably transcend the boundaries of both yes. fields? Of course. Um I slowly need to wrap up. Um, but of course there it's open outcome all the time. We've seen innovations coming out of that. We've seen PhDs, um, we've seen further projects together. So we've seen uh, a lot. But now I would like to, because we have Joe here, um, who was, as I was saying, kind of hoping that he emulated what we were speaking about. And if you would like to share, Joe, the screen. Um, sure thing. From, yes. And I just would like to take this opportunity also to thank everybody uh, that was participating out there in the world, uh, in here, in this room. And, um, and I really hope you will continue the conversation and never stop connecting. Um, it is not easy uh, because there are misunderstandings and so on. But don't stop engaging with each other because I think the world needs it across disciplinary and cultural boundaries. And um, yeah, let's let's create common grounds and um, and try um, to live up to this beautiful world we are living in, actually. Thank you, Irene, and thank you, Joe. This is very cool. I wish I could have a poster of it in my in my <laughs> office right now or in my lab on my lab door. I hope we Joe, can organize that. Joe, send us a copy. Yeah, send yes, us a copy, please. Joe. <laughs> yes. a copy. Absolutely, all the files will be uh, available uh, after the event. So, yep, that's awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. It takes time, like everything. You have to explore also this um, wild card when artists and scientists collaborate um, poster. 
So thank you, everybody. Have a great day still with many more panels and speakers that you're going to see during the web. And keep, uh, keep collaborating. Thank you. <laughs> Connect. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. And um, we are looking forward um, to Julien and Francesca. Maybe in the next web, we will have uh, you again. There will be Thank proceedings you. from the interaction. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> nice meeting you all. Bye bye, everybody. Bye, Joe. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing live art example. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye.